Coming up on Mayo Clinic Q&A. We're in this unusual situation where the pandemic is actually getting worse because of human behavior, because humans do not want to believe that the pandemic is just as important now as it was a year ago. And we're very, very concerned about what's going to happen with the cold weather, travel, holidays, waning immunity, and the potential for new uh, new variants. As the holidays approach, for many of us, that means traveling to visit family, friends, and loved ones. For those who are unvaccinated or immunocompromised and decide to travel, it's important to remember that there is a greater risk. So okay. a child could get infected, pass it to the grandparents. The other risk is that the grandparents, especially being unvaccinated, could get infected and pass it to the child. Now that risk is obviously greater for the grandparents. Their risk compared to a child of getting hospitalized, going to the ICU, ending up on a ventilator or dying far, far higher than a child's would be. Welcome everyone to Mayo Clinic q and I'm Dr. Helena Gazelka. We're recording this podcast on Monday, November the 15th, 2021. Well, unfortunately, COVID hotspots are popping up across the country again now that we're into autumn. Vaccinations and health safety uh, measures are still our best defense, however, and it's especially exciting now that kids 5 to 11 are eligible for vaccinations. Well, we have Dr. Greg Poland with us again today. You may have noticed that we are having Dr. Poland on every other week now. So for those of you looking for those programs, uh, check in with us and we'll have other great experts discussing COVID topics too. Thanks for being here today, Greg. Thank you. There's, you know, just so much new information uh, coming out almost daily. So well, it's good that tell. we talk about this. Fire away, Greg. How many 5 to 11-year-olds are getting vaccinated now that they are eligible? Well, you know, as of last week, you're right. They're they're eligible. Uh, the ACIP uh, approved it. I think it was the 12th or uh, something like that, November 12th, I believe. So um, they will start being immunized. Well, now that we've gotten <laughs> down to age 5, Greg, how long do you think it will be before we get down to kids, say, six months old? That's a really good question. You know, those studies are ongoing. So I am hoping that we will have those data get through the FDA and ACIP uh, committees in the next, <laughs> so hard to predict, the next uh, four to eight or 10 weeks, something like that. That was a good amount of hedging. Yeah, thank you. And, and the hard part about that is one of the things that tends to sometimes accelerate that. And, you know, our listeners heard it first here. Everybody else was saying, looks like we're coming to the end of the pandemic. And I have consistently said what's going to very likely happen as we get to the cooler weather, seeing the trends in travel and the holidays is that we will have another surge. Europe is surging. Germany and Austria have more cases than at any time since the start of this pandemic. Half of the U.S. states are now increasing in case numbers. Mm -hmm. 11 states have increased in the number of COVID hospitalizations. 17 states, so this isn't isolated to one or two, 17 states have already seen an, a, a trending upward of COVID deaths. And if you look at that number of deaths, and I hope this serves as a positive encouragement to, to our listeners, if you look at the 1,600 or so COVID deaths a day in the U.S., you realize that by Christmas, and you know, for a good portion of the country, Christmas is an is a eventful holiday. Somewhere around 70,000 Americans are going to die before Christmas. And that's without a surge. And I'm predicting we will have a surge. Oh, boy, that is sobering. Again. Yeah. Well, Greg, we have a, um, a mailbag, grab bag today. Some questions <laughs> from listeners, if that's okay. I will dive into that. Yeah. So the first listener wonders, is there harm in giving a healthy three to four-year-old uh, the 10 microgram dose of COVID vaccine off-label? If so, why? And how is the data driven for the cutoff ages when you're doing this kind of vaccine research? 
Alina, our, our listeners are excellent, <laughs> excellent. They ask really good questions. And that's a very insightful question. And, and there is an answer for it. In fact, what happens is the companies look at different dosages. They project, okay, this is where we're going to get the most immunity for the least number of reactions. And then they test that in larger trials. And that's exactly what's happened. You know, you and I, if we got a Pfizer vaccine, we got a 30 microgram dose. Kids younger than that, uh, you know, got a got a 10 microgram. The kids that you're talking about, the uh, the the five to 11 year olds, get that one third of the dose. We go down now to the six months to four years of age. They're going to get three micrograms, not 10, not 30. Oh, wow. And what the, what the data show is that when they give that amount at those, you know, lower dose at lower ages, they get the same immunogenicity, that is antibody level, without increasing reactogenicity, that is reactions to it. So um, I'm pretty confident that the dose that will end up being approved for the six month to four year olds will be that, that uh, three microgram, as we just talked about the five to 11 year olds are that uh, 10 microgram. And then for everybody above that 30, again, let me emphasize, we're talking about Pfizer, Moderna, we don't know yet, those data will be forthcoming. Okay, no, Greg, it's a little hard for me to separate what's different about a four-year-old than a five-year-old, an yeah. 11-year-old than a 12-year-old. Is this weight-based in some no. way? No, it's okay. not. Um, and, and age is just, a, if you will, it's somewhat of a biologic construct that we use at a population level to make decisions. I, okay. Is there a big difference between the immune system of a four-year-old and five-year-old? No, there just, there just isn't probably much of any measurable um, uh, difference in it. But how do, you, how do you communicate at a population level of what we're going to do based on dose in somebody. It's not weight-based. All right, Greg, here comes your next question. This uh, listener has a newborn child and they've been asking family members to get vaccinated even if the family member has previously had COVID and has natural immunity. They're thinking that perhaps having both the vaccine and natural immunity uh, may reduce, reduce the risk of the child or the baby becoming infected with COVID. True or false? And that thinking is true. Um, and in fact, we have data showing that people, in fact, there's a study published in the CDC's research literature called the MMWR, yeah. showing that among people who had COVID previously and did not get immunized, they had about a 2.3-fold increased risk of subsequent COVID compared to a group who previously had COVID and got immunized. We've seen that anecdotally, case reports, and uh, in studies out of Israel. So uh, that is true. The best immunity, if you survive COVID, is COVID plus vaccination. So uh, again, assuming that those uh, parents and, and visitors are immunized and immunocompetent, that is the best immunity. We use this term uh, in pertussis protection called cocooning. The idea is since that child can't be immunized, we cocoon the child by having the only people around that child be protected. And the current recommendation is even if you've had COVID, you get vaccinated. Next question. Uh, this listener states that their child is now eligible for the vaccine in the 5 to 11 uh, age group. When he finishes his vaccine series, how safe will it be for that vaccinated child to visit unvaccinated grandparents indoors uh, without a mask on? Yeah. First uh, question, why aren't they vaccinated, right? Yeah, there? right, right. And I suspect, Helena, this is a question that will, will come up in a scenario that will yes. play out a lot yes. during the holidays. So it's a serious one, deserves a serious answer. The truth is that the risk goes both ways. Mm -hmm. What the data show in children that age is that they are protected in the low 90s percentile, 91, 2, 3, something like that um, percent, meaning it's not 100%. So okay. a child could get infected 
pass it to the grandparents, the other risk is that the grandparents, especially being unvaccinated, could get infected and pass it to the child. Now that risk is obviously greater for the grandparents. Their risk compared to a child of getting hospitalized, going to the ICU, ending up on a ventilator or dying, far, far higher than a child's would be. So, uh, you know, again, these are, these are evidence-based public health recommendations for a reason. They're evidence-based. Excellent. All right, our next uh, uh, listener asks, uh, they say that they are one of the immune-compromised individuals in the moderately to severely immunocompromised category who got a third dose of Pfizer back in August when it was authorized. It wasn't called a booster, it was called a third dose. So does that mean that they get to then have a booster as a, uh, as, as a booster dose, I guess? So a fourth yes. dose, it would be. Yes, and this is, this is something that is, <laughs> you know, you talk about public health uh, messaging, it's something that is very confusing. So let me go over it carefully. This is only pertaining to people who are moderately to severely immunocompromised, okay? If you got an mRNA vaccine, you would have gotten two doses. The recommendation was that 28 or more days later, you get a late dose or a third dose, as you mentioned, Helena, <clears throat> excuse me. And then six months later, you get your booster, i.e. your fourth dose. If you started with the J&J &J vaccine, then you get your first dose. And then two months later, you get your second dose. Stop, that's the end. So with J&J, &J, it's a total of two doses. With the mRNA vaccines, it's a total of four doses. A little confusing, I recognize. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> a little bit. Who knew that people were going to have to keep track of the brand of the vaccine that they've received? And, and I wouldn't and, and, know and that it, for any other vaccine I've ever had. <laughs> it's a, it, you're exactly right. It's an illustration of how, you know, this is a new disease. And so that, that uh, the, the data and the science is increasing and improving as time goes on so that we can fine tune those recommendations. That's right. This last question is in a similar vein, Greg. When will a booster dose six months after the um, series be available for the general public? Really good question again. So um, as of this morning, three states have already implemented that. Oh. California, Colorado, and New Mexico have now said they will make booster doses available for everyone age 18 and older. That recommendation is going to be coming forward to the FDA. And based on the data uh, that we've seen in Israel, who are several months ahead of us, that is, they started their population immunization program before the U.S. did. So they got six months and 12 months out faster than we did. And their recommendation is everybody over the age of 18. Actually, I think they've lowered it even more since then, as have a few other countries. So I do believe we will see that recommendation in the U.S. All right, we will stay tuned. Anything else you'd like to share with our listeners today? Greg? There is a tremendous amount. One of the things that's a little worrisome is that in states that are surging, we are seeing uh, evidence of COVID infection in wild deer. Oh, and, uh, yes, I was going to ask you about that today. That it's incident. your hunting season in Minnesota. Yes, yes. And, and in those wild deer, the prevalence of infection actually exceeds that of humans, yet has paralleled what's happening in humans. So there is some back and forth. We don't entirely understand those dynamics, but that's bad news. What's that? What that is saying is that there may be a wildlife reservoir what that means is we will not be able to eliminate this disease. You know, a famous French philosopher said that uh, each um, culture suffers from its own pathology. 
And instead of controlling this from the very outset, we are now in a scenario where it is no longer possible as best we understand in science to eliminate that. There's some other things though. Um, and it sounds a little funny to say, but maybe it will drive certain people to go get immunized. Now we've got a, a, a study showing erectile dysfunction sixfold higher in men who got COVID. Wow. So this is, you know, that's a serious quality of life issue. You know, we, we hope uh -huh. we'll, we'll yeah. uh, see that. We're, as I mentioned, we're seeing the northern and the more rural states surging. And um, the other the piece of good news, which I'm sure people have heard about, is now a second company, happens to be Pfizer, has come out with the top line results of their antiviral trial. And th those were about 89 to 90% effective in preventing hospitalization to COVID. So we're in this unusual situation where the pandemic is actually getting worse because of human behavior, because humans do not want to believe that the pandemic is just as important now as it was a year ago. And in many places, higher levels of case burden, but their behavior is the pandemic is over. And, and we're very, very, I cannot emphasize enough, very concerned about what's gonna happen with the cold weather, travel, mm -hmm. holidays, waning immunity, and the potential for new, uh, new variants. At the same time, the science is racing ahead. Two companies now have uh, announced positive results with antivirals. We now have an EUA down to age five. Uh, about a third of Americans over the age of 65 have now gotten a booster. All of those are positive things. The question is, who's going to win the race, the virus or mankind? And it turns out that's up to us. Good reminders. Greg, I have two follow-up questions for yep. you about the deer population. Number one is, do we know if deer become ill from COVID? And number two, is it safe to eat venison? Yeah, as far as I know, um, they don't have the same clinical phenotype. That is, we don't see the same features in deer. Okay. That we, that we see in humans. I'm sure there's occasional exceptions. In terms of eating venison, that is not a problem. Uh, as long as you cook the venison properly or any of the parts that you're gonna use, as long as those are cooked to the proper temperature, that is not a risk factor. What is a risk factor is just contact with wild deer. So, uh, you know, Maybe that's a motivating thing for hunters to get immunized to protect themselves and the deer population. Excellent reminders. Thank you, Greg. My pleasure. Appreciate you being here today. Good to be here. It has been our pleasure to have Dr. Greg Poland, virology and vaccine expert here with us again today on Mayo Clinic Q&A. I hope that you learned something. I know that I did. We wish each of you a wonderful day. Mayo Clinic Q&A is a production of the Mayo Clinic News Network and is available wherever you get and subscribe to your favorite podcasts. To see a list of all Mayo Clinic podcasts, visit newsnetwork.mayoclinic.org.